Hello everyone, I'm Louis Purefold. Um, thank you for coming to my talk. I'm sorry this one has to be pre-recorded, but since the lockdown has started, my internet's been quite unreliable, so I haven't been able to stream. But um, I hope you enjoy it, and I'll be around afterwards to answer any questions. Thanks. All right, so I'm here to talk about Gleam, which is a new statically typed programming language for the Erlang virtual machine for the Beam um, that I've been working on for the last two or three years. So Gleam draws inspiration both from Beam languages, such as um, Elixir and Erlang, and also ML languages, such as Haskell and Elm. So in this talk, I'm going to take a look at these two language families and see why I think they're fantastic to work with. Um, let's take a look at some of their strengths, some of their weaknesses, and how Gleam, this new language that um, I've been working on, um, attempts to bring together some of the best traits of both. Okay, question number one. Why Erlang? So, um, I think one of Gleam's greatest strengths is that it can pass to Erlang and as such can take advantage of all the wonderful things that the Beam has to offer. As this is a Beam conference, I'm sure we're all very familiar with why the Beam is excellent, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, I'd like to go through a few of my favourite things about the virtual machine. Erlang is slightly unusual for an older functional programming language in that it originated largely from industry rather than from academia. So back in the 1980s, the telephone company Ericsson were looking for their ideal language for writing telephone switch firmware. And from this real-world need, Erlang was born. A telephone switch is a piece of hardware that connects phone calls. So when a person dials a number on their phone, their local switch identifies where the call is attempting to connect to and then helps to create a complete circuit between the caller and the receiver. Back when the telephone was first invented, this would have been the job of a person sitting at a switchboard, physically connecting different circuits with uh, lengths of wire. And sometime after that came automatic mechanical switches that didn't require a person to make the connection, but were still hooking up physical circuits. And then later still came digital switches, which would create virtual circuits within software. And so it was for these digital switches um, that Erlang was created in the 80s. So in order to meet the unusual requirements of the uh, telephony hardware, Erlang and the Beam, as an extension, developed some rather novel features. For a telephone switch to be useful, it needs to be able to support multiple phone calls at the same time. Now, if you had to wait for your neighbour to get off the phone before you could make a call, I suspect telephones probably wouldn't have ever caught on. And so because of this, Erlang needed to have excellent concurrency features so that one switch could handle many calls at once. Any program written in Erlang needs to be able to trivially perform a great number of tasks at the same time. This was such an important feature, they ended up naming the language after it. As well as being a programming language, an Erlang is a unit of concurrency. It measures seconds per second. So a telephone switch that can hold 100 simultaneous calls um, can support a load of 100 Erlangs. And the unit, Erlang, was named after this chap, Mr. Agner Erlang. He was a Danish mathematician who in the 1980s invented the Erlang formula, which continues to be a foundational element in the analysis of tele telecommunication networks and concurrent systems to this day. So by all accounts, um, quite an impressive person and a good bit of history for our ecosystem to have a link to, I think. All right, fast forward uh, 100 years back to the present day. Uh, when it comes to concurrency, the beam can definitely scale, but it's not good enough to merely be possible. Ericsson needed this to be relatively easy so that firmware developers could be as productive as possible. Asynchronous programming is notoriously difficult, especially if you're working with tools like locks, callbacks, um, shared mutable states. So the creators of Erlang went down a very different route. Rather than having a small number of threads, each handling a large number of concurrent tasks, in the Erlang world, we use a great number of threads, but each thread only has one single task to perform. If each thread only has to do one thing, it can be written in a sequential fashion. And so to paraphrase the late Joe Armstrong, one of the creators of Erlang, it is difficult to write a web server capable of handling 2 million sessions. However, 
it's much easier to write a web server capable of handling a single session and then run two million copies of it. To support this high level of concurrency and to use this, this many threads, Erlang threads are not implemented as operating system threads. Instead, they are lightweight threads, and these run on their own scheduler that is part of the Bing. Sadly, processors in telephone switches couldn't be completely isolated from each other. There's always going to need to be some element of synchronization and communication between threads in any program. So rather than using um, shared state to, or locks to communicate with each other, Erlang processes communicate by sending messages to each other. Uh, and what's more, processes within a telephone switch don't just need to talk to other processes in the same switch, they also need to talk to um, many devices all over the telephone network, as calls are going to be routed through multiple different pieces of hardware to get to their destination. So to facilitate cross-network communication, the Beam has distributed computing features built into it. When sending a message, it doesn't matter if the receiver is a process running on the same instance of the beam, or maybe it could be um, a process running on a different instance of the beam, but still on the same computer, or it could be on a completely different computer that's connected by the network somewhere. The processes can still send messages to each other in the same way. So distributed computing is built into the Beam itself, and a typical Beam program written in Erlang or Elixir can be turned into a distributed program that runs on a cluster of network computers with minimal effort. Perhaps most excitingly, at least to me, Erlang processes act as error bulkheads, meaning that when something does go wrong um, and your code crashes, the problem is contained to the smallest possible subsystem and does not any impact any of the other work undertaken by the program at that time. So an Erlang program that takes advantage of this property can self-heal by restarting the process and try again, hopefully succeeding now that any corrupt state has been shed. So in this way, um, the Beam is much like Kubernetes, the popular um, container orchestrator from Google. But what makes the Beam different from Kubernetes is that this state shedding can happen at a much more fine-grained level. We don't need to lose the state of the entire running program and all of the concurrent requests being handled by it. Instead, we lose just the single process that had the problem. And so I like to think of the relationship between the Beam and Kubernetes as being similar to um, the relationship between Kubernetes and uh, data center failover. They're, they're similar, but they operate at different levels of abstraction, and I think they can complement each other quite well. So the Beam was created um, with the problem of telephony in mind, but it turns out that what was once quite a niche set of problems is actually quite commonplace today. Concurrency, parallelism, distribution, achieving a consistent low latency, and fault tolerance. These are characteristics we want in network services today, regardless of um, exactly what they do or what language they're written in. And so the Beam, almost by chance, has become an excellent program for building uh, web applications or databases or message brokers or many of these other things that um, we as developers, particularly web developers, have to deal with on a daily basis. So now we've seen a little of why I think the Beam is a wonderful platform, but I've not answered the question of why am I creating a new language at all? We've already got several fantastic languages on the Beam, such as Erlang and Elixir and LFE and more. Um, why have I spent all this time creating Gleam when I could use one of these? And so to answer this question, I'd like to take a closer look at the Beam's self-healing properties and how that impacts as developers of software and uh, as operators of software, because we have to run the programs that we make. So hypothetical situation, it's a normal day at the office and I've got a change to make to an application. Perhaps I'm adding a feature, maybe we're removing a bug. It doesn't matter, I've got to make some sort of change to the code. So I start by um, editing the code a little, by making some changes. Once satisfied, I run the compiler to build the application, which completes successfully, reporting no problems. After that, I run the unit tests on my laptop to make sure I've not broken anything. And when they come back green, I push my changes up to GitHub. Once I've uploaded um, my code, 
it triggers a, a build on the CI server. It runs all the unit tests, all the integration tests, maybe it runs some linters like Elvis and uh, Credo, and it tries to spot any mistakes that I've made. And if all those checks pass, it then deploys the uh, new application version to a staging environment. And on the staging environment, I can manually test the application and demo the new behavior to uh, stakeholders who, um, if satisfied, give the green light to continue. Meanwhile, on GitHub, the code is reviewed by some of my peers, um, by some of the other programmers on the team. Uh, they may have insights and con uh, context that I do not, so they know how to do something differently, or they may spot a problem that I can't see. But they're happy with my changes, and they approve it, and so the code gets merged into master, which triggers another CI build. All the tests and linters are run again to ensure that no problems were introduced in the merging process. And then lastly, once the tests have passed, the code is then deployed and released into production and to the users. Satisfied with a job well done, I can go to lunch or go home or, or you know, go about my day. But then, disaster strikes. Users are reporting that the application is no longer working as intended. Right at the very beginning of the process, when I was editing the code, I made a mistake. I introduced a bug. And each one of these steps has failed to detect the problem. And now the bug has snuck into production. So luckily, um, the application is written in Erlang. So the impact of the problem has been minimized thanks to the fault tolerant properties. But there still is a problem. Something is wrong with production. And now I have to fix it as a matter of urgency. In this instance, the problem was discovered just a few hours after I made the mistake. So the change is still fresh in my mind, not too difficult to correct. But that's not always the case. Depending on the uh, culture of the company I'm working at, it might take days or weeks for the change to be deployed to production. Um, what, one of my last jobs was working at a bank, and I think it was about two months before I managed to get anything to production. Or alternatively, it might have been deployed, and then it might have taken even longer for users to discover the problem, because it might have only happened in a small set of scenarios. Worst case, um, the code has been in production for months or maybe even years, and the writer of the bug has since left the company and gone somewhere else. And so now I'm left trying to fix a bug uh, with unfamiliar code that I've never seen before. Maybe I don't even know what it does. The larger the gap between a mistake being made and a problem being detected, the more difficult it will be to fix. Of course, this isn't the only factor, but it is an important multiplier in terms of how difficult it's going to be. So Erlang gives us the tools to tolerate mistakes, and it gives us tools to debug them, but they largely only help us once there already is a problem in production. And that time cost and that loss of familiarity is far from optimal. It's in fact quite expensive. So what I really want is for problems to be detected here, immediately after the mistake was made. What I want is for the feedback loop to be as fast as possible so we can spend less time doing um, exploratory investigative work, such as debugging problems in production, and more time iterating, actually providing business value and having fun making things. So Gleam aims to provide this fast feedback loop by introducing a type system inspired by those found in the ML family of languages. And why these languages? Um, because I believe that these are the languages that currently do the best job of providing this fast feedback loop. So let's take a look at some examples. So Messenger is um, Facebook's web chat program. It has 1.3 billion monthly users. Back in 2016, they started converting the um, web client from JavaScript to a dialect of OCaml called Reason. And a year later, 50% of their code was written in Reason. And they had this to say. Messenger used to receive bugs on a daily basis. Since the introduction of Reason, there has been a total of 10 bugs. That's during the whole year, not per week. Refactoring speed went from days to hours to dozens of minutes. So that's quite an impressive statement. Next, we have um, No Red Ink. Uh, they are a company in the United States that provide educational software. And back in 2016, they started adding Elm uh, to their CoffeeScript web application with great success. And in 2018, one of their engineers, Richard Feldman, posted this tweet. 
After two years and 200,000 lines of production Elm code, we got our first production runtime exception. In that period, our legacy JavaScript code has crashed a mere 60,000 times. Again, quite impressive. But that's not to say that the engineers at No Word Inc. and Facebook are without error. They're going to make just as many mistakes as you or I. The key takeaway here is that they have a way of discovering and fixing their mistakes before they get into production. Lastly, Lumi. Um, Lumi are a company that provide um, custom, eco-friendly, branded packaging for online stores. And in 2018, they started converting their JavaScript front-end into a PureScript front-end. And after a few months of PureScript in anger, engineer uh, Brandon Martin had this to say. I've had such a positive experience with little mental overhead, and I have total trust in the compiler. I implemented an entire page with a list of data, filters, search and pagination, and it worked first time. What I really like about this quote is this idea of a feeling of trust in the compiler, in that it is something that can be relied upon. With Gleam, I, I really want to create this experience on the beam of the compiler being like a pair programming partner, and it is there to help you by catching mistakes as quickly as possible and providing additional insight. So how do these languages achieve this? They do it by having a compiler that is capable of analyzing the code for inconsistencies and providing precise feedback to the programmer, detailing every place where a problem may arise. So once the programmer has this tool, this ability to discover all of the possible problems in an application, they can change the way that they approach writing code. So the new system becomes the programmer first makes an edit which informs the compiler of the kind of change they wish to make. So for example, um, perhaps a function has been changed to sometimes return a null value under certain circumstances. In languages like Erlang, that doesn't have this static analysis, it is now up to the programmer to find all of the places in the code base that need to be updated to handle this new nullable value. In Erlang, we might do this by using a mix of uh, existing unit tests and just a familiarity with the code base, knowing where this function is going to be used. And that would help with this manual uh, change. But in Gleam and ML languages, the compiler out outputs a to-do list of inconsistencies. And then the programmer just goes through each place in the list, fixing them one by one. There is no longer any need to do any discovery work. State the change you wish to make, and then the compiler shows you how to integrate that change. And as I've said before, you can achieve this same thing with a set of unit tests if they're robust. But I think that having the compiler do it via static analysis has a few advantages. We don't have to worry that perhaps our tests aren't comprehensive enough. Maybe they miss some edge cases. The static analysis always covers all edge cases and always covers the entire code base. The compiler gives it to us for free. It even covers code that is hard to test, so code that um, performs I.O., the interacts with external services that maybe we don't have available in tests. Secondly, this static analysis is fast. A large code base can be checked in seconds or fractions of a second, while tests could take minutes or um, not even be possible to run on your local machine. Thirdly, the compiler can provide the precise location of the cause of the error, while tests can only give you the location of a resulting symptom. Once a test prevents an error, it is then up to the programmer to determine if the problem originated where the error was detected by the test, or it's somewhere further up the chain. It could be somewhere else entirely. With static analysis, the programmer doesn't have to do any discovery work, which rapidly cuts down on the amount of time you have to spend developing your program. It might seem that with this ML style um, error detection, the Beam's runtime fault tolerance and error handling features are slightly redundant, but actually I think they can complement each other quite nicely. The error detection means that we are aware of all the places where the problem can occur, and then we can make an explicit decision about how we want to handle it. And because the decision of how to handle an error is now explicit, the compiler can tell if a crash is intentional or if a mistake has been made. Let's look at some examples. Imagine a problem that is caused um, by a mistake on my part as a programmer. So for example, here I'm trying to reverse a binary string, but I'm using a function that reverses lists. 
In this case, once the error has been highlighted to me by the compiler, I realize I've made a mistake, and then I go and fix the bug. Erlang's fault tolerance isn't the right tool here. If a trivial mistake has been made, I want to find it as quickly as possible, and I want to fix it. Another situation in which errors might arise is when dealing with user input. Here we have a handler function from a web application. Um, it takes a request data structure, and it returns an appropriate response. As part of this, it reads some data from the body, and that data has been encoded in the JSON format. The problem here is that the request body might not actually contain valid JSON. We can't always rely on getting the correct input from the outside world. Once this problem has been highlighted to us by the static analysis tooling, the most practical thing to do is to check whether the JSON is valid or not. Uh, if it isn't, we can then return the error to the user, informing them that they have made a mistake, that there's something wrong with their JSON encoding. If we can pass the error back up the chain to the user, that's often the best thing to do. Erlang's fault tolerance isn't the right tool here either. So another example. I used to work at a, uh, a startup that did video transcoding, and we had a lot of jobs that ran in the background. And as a result, they didn't immediately have a user attached to them. One of the jobs looked like this. First, it looked at some metadata for a video from the database. Then it created some thumbnail images for the video. And lastly, it transcoded the video. Each one of these steps is expected to always succeed according to our business logic. But because of the nature of programming and just the universe in general, there's a very real chance that one of these things could fail. A faulty hard drive could have corrupted the video file, or perhaps uh, the unreliable network causes the database lookup to fail, or there could be a bug in the uh, third-party video transcoding software that we're using that causes it to crash. So the ML-style error detection here forces the programmer to acknowledge these potential problems, and we end up with this verbose nested code. After each step, the programmer has to check to see whether it failed, and then do something with the error. This code is much less clear than the previous version, and it's much harder to tell what the actual business logic is here, because it's being obscured by the error handling. We could rewrite the job using some higher order functions that extract uh, some of the conditional logic. This removes the nesting, but now the reader needs to be familiar with all of these combinators that's been used in this code. And the code is much more uh, complicated than what we started with. And to make matters worse, it's not even clear what we should do with the error once we have it. There's no user to return the error to. Perhaps we need to create some sort of error logging system. And at this point, I'm really hoping that um, you're leaping forward to say that there is a better way. There is a better approach than this defensive programming. And that better approach is offensive programming. Here is where we take advantage of Erlang. If your business logic says that something should never fail and that you have no way of reasonably handling the failure, don't check for the error. Instead, make the assertion saying, in order to continue, no error must have happened. And if there was an error, we crash the process as there's no sensible way to continue at the process level. And now, the Beam's fault-tolerant properties come into play. The crash is logged and reported, and the process can be restarted as required. The rest of the program continues running without problem. And so as the Erlang saying goes, let it crash. So the ML time system helps us find all places where an error can happen, and then we can categorize those errors into two different groups. Errors that are expected within our domain, such as invalid user inputs, we can deal with them locally using conditional logic. Errors which are exceptional and happen outside of our domain, such as data corruption, hardware failure, we can handle them in a non-local fashion using processes and the beam. If an error is truly unexpected, it shouldn't get in the way of your business logic, and you shouldn't have to write extra code in your program to tolerate it. So hopefully after that you understand a little of Gleam's philosophy and what Gleam is trying to achieve as a language. So now let's take a look at where Gleam is going as, as a project. So we've just had our 0.7 release, which was a big one for us. We've reached a point where the core language is quite usable, and so the focus has been on helping Gleam become a productive language for its users. 
The first big feature of Gleam 0.7 was a code formatter. Any Elixir programmers in the room are probably familiar with uh, the Elixir formatter, which was introduced in 1.6. This is very similar, but for Gleam. We've introduced a formatter quite early in the development of the language, and I think that will really help establish a canonical style for the community as it grows, as well as providing some editing conveniences that we've become accustomed to in languages like Elixir that already have a formatter. So the second big feature of Gleam 0.7 was uh, documentation generation. Up until this point, it's been tricky to start writing Gleam, as there's been no good way to determine what types and functions are available to you in the standard library or in hex packages that you've included into your Gleam project. To solve this, we've got a documentation generator in the style of edoc or xdoc, complete with hexdocs integration, so Gleam library documentation can be found the same way as Erlang or Elixir library documentation online. So what about 0.8? What's coming next for Gleam? At the moment, our focus is largely on making type-safe processes and type-safe OTP, which is quite an exciting project. And I'm happy to report that we've had quite a lot of success in this area. Previously, we were asking the question, is it possible to have a productive and type-safe version of OTP? And now we're confident the answer is yes, and we're working on what exactly should the API be. Peter Saxton, the creator of the Pure Elixir web server and web framework, ACE and RAX, has started creating a pure Gleam web server called Midas using typed OTP. This is really exciting as it shows what is possible using typed OTP and it gives us a real project with which to find any ways that we can improve our design. So we've got a small but steadily growing community with more and more people contributing changes to the language, to the compiler, uh, to the standard library and joining the discussion in our IRC channel. If any of this seems interesting or exciting to you, please do get involved. It will be really excellent to have you on board. And lastly, if you really want to help out Gleam get production ready, please consider sponsoring the project or asking your employer to sponsor the project on GitHub. Building a language takes a lot of time, and the more sponsorship we have, the more time we'll be able to invest in building the language and building the ecosystem. My name is Louis Pilfold. Thank you very much for listening. All right, thank you. Uh, we have one question from our audience. Let me read it out. Mm, Louis, did you know about another project, Elhemi, an Elm compiler with Elixir as target? And what do you think about it? For sure. Um, first, sorry, sorry, my internet's actually dropped out, so I'm on my phone at the moment. But the, uh, the Alchemy project's really interesting, and I particularly like the language Elm. Um, However, for me, there's a few problems with this approach, which means I don't think it's the ideal solution for types on a beam. The main one being that Elm and um, the beam are, are quite semantically different languages. So Elm is a pure language. It doesn't have any side effects at all in the entire language, while the beam is all about side effects. We're like creating processes, that's a side effect. We're like sending messages, that's a side effect. You know, we're really interested in, in um, doing lots of staple things. We're very pragmatic. Um, and so I think if you take Elm and put it on top of the beam without making modifications to the language, you end up with um, something that's quite limited. Um, and the Alchemy project has added some additions to Elm in order to make it fit. But um, they, and so there's always going to be a core team are intending to do what they're trying to do and what the Alchemy team are doing. Um, there are also other projects in a similar nature that are quite interesting. So there is a pure script um, to Erlang compiler, which is um, a really wonderful piece of engineering and is being used in production by a couple of companies that I'm aware of. It's called PureL. I recommend checking that one out. And there's also a language called um, Alpaca, um, which is in another ML style language which compiles to Erlang. Um, uh, which, which is a little more ML than, than Gleamers. It's also worth checking out, but sadly, it doesn't seem to be actively developed anymore. So there, there's quite a few different approaches to this problem, and I just I hope that one one of these projects succeeds. I would like it to be Gleam, but hopefully one of us succeeds, and then we'll have all these lovely properties on the beam. 
Excellent. Thank you very much for the answer. I hope this addresses very well the question. And thank you very much for streaming today. Uh, that was all for that we had for the session. Hope to see you in the next one. Thank you, Louis. Thank you. Bye-bye.